So welcome from wherever you're watching us. Thank you for joining us. I'm very happy to be hosting another session in this series that WPHF, uh, the World Pranic Healing Foundation is doing called the In Conversation with, where we try and get different people with different backgrounds to talk about different topics. And today's topic is empowered parenting. And as you can see, I have with me the lovely Jandak Jabur Rajagopal. Long, long, nice long long name. name. <laughs> Jan for short happy. enough. Otherwise, that by itself requires time to remember. <laughs> so I'm really excited to have Jandak here. I've known her for a couple of years now. Uh, and Jandak is a pre and parent, that's a long list of uh, you know, qualifications that are there, but she's a pre and perinatal educator, psychologist, psychotherapist. She's a pranic healer. She's an erratic yoga practitioner. She's an educator. Uh, she does counseling, therapy sessions, play therapy as well, and uh, lots of things. And of course, she's a beautiful, beautiful human being. And I've attended some of her sessions, and uh, they're always so much full of learning and sharing. And today's session, as we know, is on all about empowered parenting. And one thing, whether you're a parent now, whether you're looking forward to being a parent, mm -hmm. one thing that we've all gone through is a stage of being a child. And we're going to be talking about all those stages and how energy is, you know, helpful as a child, as a parent. And in all those stages, I'm not going to talk too much. I'm going to hand the floor right over to Shandak. Take it away. Thank you, Nina. That was a beautiful introduction. I'm grateful to be here with all of you from all parts of the world uh, on a Saturday, that too, on a weekend. I can see some people are watching together and that's always beautiful to see. There are some family members together and that's lovely too. So thank you all for being here. For those of you who are watching live and then also for those of you who will be watching the recording later. Um, as Nina said, this topic is very close to my heart and I love doing this work because it is the foundation of everything else in life. It is life itself. And exploring it and diving into it is one of the most satisfying things I've done in my life. Couple it with the knowledge of energy, which Master Choa brings to us, who is the founder of the Pranic Healing and Arhatic Yoga School, makes it so simple, easy, and accessible that even something as parenthood, which requires a lot of planning, a lot of dedication, becomes that bit easier and more accessible and fun to do because we understand all the different aspects that impact parenthood. But before I start, I would like to ask you a question. What do you think parenthood means? What is parenthood for you? Whether you are a parent already or not, what does parenthood entail? And for those of you who are parents, were you planning to get pregnant when you did? Were you planning your children or did it just happen? Uh, what were the emotions and thoughts that were going in your head during that early period? So these are some questions I would like to leave you with to ponder on during this session. And I'll also touch upon them. And if we have time, also open the mic for some of you, if we do. And um, we will also be going into a bit of the science behind this and the psychology and of course the energy. But before we start, I would like to read one of my favorite poems from one of my favorite poets. I think many of you know this poem, it's called Children. It's from the book, The Prophet, which is written by Jubran Khalil Jubran, who's a Lebanese poet the country that I originally come from. And he says the following, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, 
but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children, as living arrows, are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness. For even as he loves the arrow that flies, so also he loves the bow that is stable. For me, this was written way before the science of pre and perinatal psychology was in, uh, in presence and discovered and researched, way before we knew what was happening in the womb, before there were ocular sounds. And what you'll notice also the different traditions from different civilizations, from different religions, talk about the experience of the baby and the child. And all of them say the same thing, that the baby is conscious. Now for mothers and parents and fathers that are here, this is a concept they can relate to. But sometimes, even though we know it intellectually, the way we approach it is not necessarily in alignment with that knowledge. So Nina, let us start delving into this topic. And uh, let's see what are the questions that you received based on what people are looking for to know in the field of parenthood. That's, by the way, to start with, that's one of my favorite, favorite poems and also one of my favorite poets. Uh, and, you know, uh, just kicking off the whole uh, discussion, the first thing is, how exactly is the prenatal stage important? We know already it's established that the prenatal stage is important. Earlier on, it was thought that babies don't have feelings, they don't feel, they don't register things. But science has shown now that they do. So I think a good place to start from would be, how is that prenatal stage important? And not only the prenatal stage, even sometimes a lot of couples today work on planning on having a child. I mean, sometimes it just happens, but, <laughs> you know. So how is yeah. that important? Yeah, there's the coronavirus, we're caught up at home, you need some entertainment, right? And then nine months later, the entertainment result is out there in a form. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist that. Anyway, so yes, like you said, Nina, many young parents now are embarking on the journey of parenthood with more consciousness, with more awareness. And that is so beautiful to see. And like you said, now it is established that the prenatal period is very important. But let's look at it and let's understand why it is important. Now, another one of my favorite scientists, and I'm going to talk about so many different people in the field, so you can go later on, research it, understand it more, because this is just 45 minutes and we're barely going to touch upon the subjects. There is a scientist called Bruce Lipton. Many of you know him from his book, Biology of Belief. Even the video of that is available on YouTube for you to see. He says our pre and perinatal experiences form our biological template, which colors subsequent feelings and attitudes about ourselves, our relationships with others, and our connection to earth and spirit. Awareness of this important programming mechanism can be used to prevent further harm, as well as heal places in our hearts and minds where we ourselves acquired limiting programs. Now, what does this say? Not only are babies, babies conscious, they are absorbing whatever is happening in their environment. And the interesting thing, Nina and everyone, about this field is these different fields started popping up around almost the same time. 
they say when we are ready for more teachings, for more learning, when our understanding expands, we get more informed about what is happening. So the field of pre and perinatal psychology, the field of pranic healing, which is the energy healing, and the field of epigenetics, which I'm also going to touch upon, all these three started around approximately the same time, 35 plus years ago. And each one of them gives us a preview of what is happening inside the womb and the importance of understanding this and working with it. Now, many of you who are here have attended some of the previous sessions that were organized by the World Pranic Healing Foundation, and you've been exposed to the concept of energy, the concept of aura, the concept of the fact that we're not just this physical body, there's more to us than just this physical body, that we have an energy field around us and that we have an emotional body, a mental body, and beyond that, that we are a spirit experiencing ourselves in this world through these different bodies or through these different vehicles. One of the most beautiful courses you would take to understand how this spirit, how this soul incarnates and comes into existence is a course taught by Master Chawa Koksvi called Achieving Oneness with a Higher Soul. Okay, so it's available in book format too. And this book and this course addresses some of the questions many of us have. Why are we here? Where did we come from? When we leave here, where do we go? This is the journey of the soul, the journey of this baby that is coming to incarnate. And in the book, Master Chawa talks about how the different uh, seeds of consciousness, which we, are, we refer to as the physical permanent seed, emotional permanent seed, and consciousness permanent seed, are lodged in the baby in the first six weeks of the baby's life while in the womb. And how then the incarnated soul or a portion of the soul gets lodged during the seventh month. But we'll talk about that when we come to the actual period of pregnancy. Now we're talking about the period before. What science has discovered is that whatever the mother goes through, the experiences the mother goes through, her emotions, her thoughts, her feelings, everything that is happening in her environment has an impact on the baby. And that's why Nina said, now it's established. This period is very important during the development of the baby. But what we don't know is that it's not just the period during which the mother is pregnant. It's also before that, way before that. Now, in, from a scientific perspective, they can go back and observe the environment of the mother. That's something you can see, you know, how does she live? How's the house environment, the relationship with the husband, the relationship with the family. But the field of epigenetics has helped us to go beyond that, further beyond that, into the time of the grandmother. And there's an article, you can Google it, called Ghosts in Your Genes, that talks about how the experiences, not the mother, not her mother, but the great grandmother goes through impacts the baby in the womb. So imagine three generations before the baby's even formed, before there's a thought of the parents thinking, okay, let's get pregnant. All these experiences are there. And how is that? Well, basically, when a baby is getting formed in the, in the womb, the fetus, a baby girl has all the eggs formed there. So imagine your great grandmother is pregnant with your mother, right? During that time, you as a cell, little tiny cell, potential of you is already there in your mother's ovaries as she is a baby in her mother, mother's womb. So imagine that you as a tiny cell are already absorbing the energies of your mother and the energies of your um, grandmother. So uh, now even they're saying it goes back to three generations, four generations, five generations, but three generations are easy to monitor and there's enough research on that. So imagine uh, all of us here, many of us, some of us I can see are millennials, some of us are a bit older than that, but I'm not going to ask you about your age, don't worry. But our parents may have experienced adversaries through life. 
They may have experienced, for example, war, famine, uh, some natural calamities. All these experiences that happened in the environment would have an impact on them and so would have an impact on us. So this is the field of pre and perinatal psychology where we map all this history, our ancestral history, and look into it. And we ask the question, what are we bringing from our past? What is our ancestral heritage? There's the good and there's the not so good. Sometimes there is the trauma that they're experienced to. Sometimes because of that trauma, there's the resilience that is built. So we have the gifts from the past and the things that need healing. But with that awareness, we can actually heal any of the experiences that our great grandparents have gone through, that are lodged in us, that are affecting the patterns and behaviors and the way we approach the world. Even if the mother was exposed to stress during pregnancy, that can be healed. But why focus on healing? Why not actually make sure that we present our children with the best potential for them to come by starting the work on ourselves? So the first step is for the parents to be, not just to plan the pregnancy, but to start working on themselves, reflecting on what is it that they've inherited as patterns, because we humans are patterns, are all made of patterns. In our nervous system, there are patterns. In our energy system, there are patterns. What is it that we can start working on healing so that we don't pass these on to our children? So that's the first step. So basically, it's yeah. the environment that is affecting you even before a child is born. And then the mold kind of decides the final product as well. So that's where you're taking us that we have to take care of the planning, of the thoughts, the environment, and then make sure that the mold is really good. Yes, Nina. That's a very way of putting it pictorially and depicting it. It's like we all have a blueprint with which we come. And our blueprint, all of us, our blueprint is wholeness. Ray Castellino, who is another one of the pioneers in the field of pre and perinatal psychology, who passed away just recently, he said that we all have a blueprint that we come with, a plan. Like Nina, you said, there is mold, there's the environment, but before that, there is a plan. And that plan is whole. All of us want to come with the best uh, ingredients and potential for growth and for living our lives. So imagine that you are the architect of this plan, because in reality we are. And imagine that you are crea creating the blueprint of your house. And so you decide, you know, on this uh, mapping you're doing of the house, this is where the bedroom is going to be, this is the kitchen, this is the dining area, living area, play area, etc. And then you go into the details of, okay, we're going to have wooden tiles for the floor, this kind of lighting, and so on. So you decide this is the plan. Now comes the execution. You look around you, and in terms of the material that is available, there isn't any wooden tiling. There's only ceramic tiling. So you have to make do with that, and you pick up the ceramic tiling because you have to do the flooring. And then you realize that you know you wanted the door to be a certain height, but because of certain rules and regulations that are there about how high the door has to be, how high the building has to be, you have to tweak a bit your blueprint. And soon enough, you realize that the actual product that results is different from what you had planned. So that's the first thing. And then comes the house that is built with as close as possible, given the material that is available to the plan. But there's the environment. There's the rain that is falling, there's the sun, and there's wind, sometimes there are tornadoes, and that can wreak havoc on the house. And so unless the house has a strong foundation, these natural calamities, the environment affects it. So we are in a way like that blueprint of the house. And what we need to do is establish a strong foundation, try to use as good as possible material or building blocks to establish that foundation and to build our house. 
That's absolutely correct. That's very correct. You need to have the best possible available material and uh, some of it at least is in our hands, at least making sure that our energy is correct, our thinking and all is right. But then let's move to the next one. Like once the baby is there in a sense, the mother conceives. And then what happens during pregnancy? How does the energy affect the, the child as, uh, you know, during the pregnancy? Like Master Choa clearly states that, uh, like there's that whole quote, which we mentioned even in our posts, that wise men have women look at happy pictures and, you know, read good books and uh, that affects the child. So I believe there, Someone's asked the question, how does the father's energy impact the baby? And uh, already the fathers to be can already think of making sure that the energy they're sending the mother, first of all, uh, is going to affect the child. But uh, what do you have to say about the stage when the child is actually in the womb? Absolutely, Nina. That's a very good question. And I think many here have, have it. And I'm glad someone asked about the father's energy. Because many a time when we're talking about this subject, uh, people think of the baby, think of the mother, but somehow the father is forgotten in the background. But remember, it takes the two, the sperm and the egg to form the baby, right? So it takes two to tango, as they say. So the role of the father and the role of the mother is very important. Both of them working together as a unit is very crucial to the development of a baby. I'm gonna talk about a couple of things since the question about the father came up, about how the dad's role is really crucial in the development of a baby. Now for fathers, it's a bit more difficult because they're outside and like kind of the observer into what's happening. Like they, they've done the job and then the rest, the mother's working on it for uh, about um, uh, 41 weeks uh, because I don't like using the term nine months. It's not really accurate. Um, so the mother is experiencing the baby, the baby growing in her and all of that. But the dad is almost like watching what is happening. Uh, but the reality is that whatever the dad is experiencing, whatever the mother is experiencing, the fetus in the womb is absorbing all these energies. It's not just the energy of the mother that's being absorbed, it's also the energy of the dad. I'd like to share here a story, Nina, about that. Uh, from one of the therapy sessions that was done uh, by uh, Joseph Shilton Pierce another pioneer in the field. He has written the book Magical Child. It's really a beautiful one to read. And even though it's got scientific data in it, it's very easy to read. And so I would recommend it to all parents and parents-to-be. And in that, he's talking about this kid who's about seven years old. And his parents got him to therapy because he was a very angry child. He would beat other kids up and he was always shouting. Uh, his parents could not control him and they were worried about him being expelled from school. You know, the regular things that sometimes parents face when kids um, are misbehaving at school or there's a problem that the kids are experiencing. And so they were getting him into therapy and many sessions were happening with children. It's more play therapy kind of thing. And um, there was a lot of negativity. You could feel the mother is very anxious. The dad is very anxious. They love their son, but they're really worried and wondering why is it that he's behaving that way? Hi, daughter of Gauri. I can see you there. And um, when in one of the sessions, the therapist asked this child, can you share with me a happy moment that you've experienced? And this kid, playing with the toys or whatever, suddenly turns around and says, I love the time when we as a family travel together on a cruise. And I remember very beautifully that um, we were out on the deck and there was this beautiful island and the scenery was just amazing. Okay, I'm just paraphrasing his words. And um, you see the mother shaking her head and the dad is like, 
we've never traveled. Uh, we've been so caught up with taking care of our son, we don't have time for traveling. And this dialogue is happening at the same time. And so here the therapist realizes there's something and he poses and asks the parents, so your, your child never traveled. And the mother says, no, we've never had the chance to travel. He's been quite a handful since he's, he's come and we didn't travel. And then the dad actually remembers and says, but you know what? When we discovered that you are pregnant, we said, let's take a holiday for ourselves because once the child comes, we're not gonna have time for ourselves. And so we bought ourselves a cruise and we went on that cruise. And remember you were standing on the deck and you said exactly what you said. We were standing on the deck and I remembered you because you were so happy at that time holding your belly and you said, what a wonderful island that is. It's really, really pretty. And so what we discover from this story is the child was narrating the experience of the mother when she was pregnant with him. And his happy moment was that because the parents said, after our baby comes, we're going to be so busy, so anxious, so caught up with taking care of a child, we won't have time for that. So as a family, although they cared about their child, they didn't have time for fun. They didn't have time to spend together as a loving, happy family. And there are so many such stories. Nina, do you remember that story from the Mahabharata? Oh, yes. yes. Uh, about Abu Manya. I mean, that story is quite ancient, but holds true now. Can you share that? So it's, I think most of the people from India will know that story very well. It's where uh, Abhimanyu was still in the mother's womb and the father is telling the mother of how, he's talking about warfare and how to enter what we call a chakra view. It's, it's a war formation. And then the mother falls asleep. So he learned the part of entering the chakra view, but since the mother fell asleep, he never learned how to come out of it. And uh, when there was uh, the actual war that happened between the Kauravs and the Pandavas, he was able to enter in. But then of course he got sacrificed because he didn't know how to come out. And he'd learned that according to legend while he was still in the womb of the mother. And there are many, many stories like that that take us back to this whole, I really do feel that science is catching up to spirituality in many ways and all these, you know, uh, schools of energy, uh, including our school, are really able to relate to that ancient knowledge so well. And it's all there in the stories and legends that we have from the past that is there. And like you said, uh, children remember and we spoke about this whole thing about couples not having time once the children come in. And even in our last session with Sriram, if some of you remember that, and the fact how important it is to take out that time to save relationships so that they can actually give the child a happy time as well, because happy parents will make happy children. And exactly, Nina. You know. And that's the first thing, like Masachoa said in the Miracles book, that quote that we shared for the uh, session, that men uh, that are smart, that are conscious, would actually surround their wives, their pregnant wives, with a beautiful environment, with a calm environment, uh, with good books to read, uh, good stories, any kind of spiritual books, scientific books, because everything the mother is experiencing is going into the baby. And the languages that the parents speak, whatever those languages are, are easier for the baby to pick up and learn later on. So one of the things some parents to be do actually start reading uh, things in different languages just to prepare the child to pick up those languages later on if they want to. I know of one parent who didn't understand anything from maths books, from science books, from languages, but she was just reading these things and saying, okay, fine, my baby will be equipped with whatever it is. I'm gonna read a bit of arts, I'm gonna read a bit of science. And so whatever he or she will need later on, at least I've given them something that I don't understand it, but they have it. And so it's part of the preparation. And the baby, one of the first, um, the first organ that develops for a baby is a baby's heart. And it's really beautiful to see if you get the chance to Google that. It starts as one cell beating, okay? And then it starts inviting other cells to it 
with that beat and they start beating harmoniously together and after a while they form the heart it's really beautiful to see the synchronicity of how that is that beat is like a calling a voice and we know we spoke many sessions about the power of the word and that the word is vibration and so this heart cell starts beating and calling into it other cells and that's from an energetic perspective the first seed of these permanent seeds that I refer to that is um, installed into the baby is the physical permanent seed and it's in the heart. So there's always a correlation between what is happening physically, emotionally, mentally and spiritually. But sometimes, as Nina said, science needs to catch up. And then the first sense that is developed is the sense of touch, and then later on, smell and um, uh, taste and the other uh, senses. And the last is vision. So it's very important that not only the mother experiences um, good thoughts and good emotions, but also engages physically with the baby through the uh, touch through the hands. And those of you who are pranic healers, you know the power of the hand. This is the hand that waves to remove dirty energy. And this is the hand that gives uh, clean energy. And this is where the fathers can be engaged too. They can talk to the baby. They can actually play games with the baby. And this is uh, easier to experience in, during the second and third trimester once the baby starts moving because the baby will physically respond to your um, conversation and communication. And so it won't be a one-way communication, it will be both ways. And they will tell you, literally tell you, whether they're enjoying something or not. How do they do that? There's something called prenatal bonding exercises. And in that, the parents can play something called, like for example, tap, tap, or kick, kick, because you know the baby's active during that time, where, for example, you ask questions, do you like the color green? something as simple as that. Uh, but before that, you kind of uh, communicate this language that you're going to use with a baby. And you say, for example, one kick, yes, two kicks, no. And so there's a period of attunement that we do for the one kick, two kicks. And then we start asking these questions. And I kid you not, first time I heard this, I was like, yeah, right. But then when I started experiencing this with the parents and after the baby is born, and I realized like, oh, he said when he was in the womb that he likes the color green and he chooses all the green toys. It's like, oh my God, there is directly a correlation. The type of food, the things that they like. Uh, some of the people that I work with have um, engaged in choosing the birth method that their child prefers. And it's incredible how, detail, how much details you can get from your child. And you realize that you're communicated from early on. Many mothers here, I'm sure, will tell you they've had dreams. They've had some uh, direction of what the baby wants and what the baby does not want, what the baby like, what the baby does not like. Again, uh, there are many stories about how when the mother goes for some tests and some baby doesn't like needles, for example, pushing the needle away. And you can see that when they're doing the scan, when they're doing the ultrasound, the baby moving away because the baby doesn't want the needle. So do not underestimate how conscious the baby is and your influence on them. The research also says that when the dad, along with the mother, engages in this communication with the child, when they test the brain development of that fetus, and later on their IQ, the intelligent quotient, and EQ, emotional quotient, all of them score higher than the babies that are not communicated with, that are not engaged with during the time of pregnancy. So it not only does it establish that communication, it actually benefits your baby and helps them in their brain development, helps them in our, their IQ development and EQ development. So both parents are really crucial during that time. Not only during the pregnancy, also after, because many times in many cultures, you know, there's this rule that genders take on that, okay, the mothers will take care of the child, the fathers will bring in the bread. And uh, a lot of times there's this whole thing of, uh, okay, certain responsibilities are only the mothers and, you know, but we're learning more and more that both the parents 
will affect the child. And the next question, and I know we're running short of time already and there's so many questions in the group, is that what if that has not been done? What if that time has already gone by? Then how can you use uh, energy healing to correct or make a change for the children who've not had that whole system? Because, you know, you still... I mean, if someone's already reached an adolescent stage or if you're an adult who's not had the changes or the right energy when you were younger or maybe in the prenatal stage or during the child's developmental stages, what can be done now? I think the greatest- I think that is one of the greatest questions and the most important questions, Nina. And I'm really glad you asked it because you're right. We've all experienced, like, it's not realistic not to expect, expect us to go through difficulties in life. And it's not realistic to assume that even if the family and the parents strive to have a good environment during the pregnancy, that there won't be stress. Look at what is happening in the world now. One day we're all going to work. The next day there's a lockdown. There's a virus that is affecting us globally. And suddenly, not only all are all the roles changed, but the dynamics of how the world is operating is changed. Look at how much technology has become to be come to be a crucial part of our life. Many people earlier used to say technology is bad, but can you imagine this lockdown period without technology? What would have happened to us? So one of the things that as parents and as individuals, regardless of whether we are parents or not, that we need to look into is that the world is evolving. Humanity is evolving. And what was true thousands of years ago may not be true now. We need to adapt to the change in times. The role, the gender role that you talked about, Nina, was very necessary in the olden days because during the hunting period of our evolution, the gatherer-hunter period, it was necessary for the preservation of societies of humankind. So the strong men, physically strong, that time, the physical body was important, needed to go out, get the food, uh, kill the animal, protect against predators. And the mother, because she's pregnant, doesn't have access to all the things we have to for now, needed to stay at home, take care of the child, uh, protect the herd, so to speak. But we're no longer living in that kind of an environment. There is no predator attacking us. And now both men and women go out to work. Both men and women engage in all kinds of activities to manage this lockdown. You heard many families saying that, you know, we need to share the roles. It's no longer she does this, I do that. We need to come together to do things to make sure that our family functions in the best way. And this whole gender difference is becoming a bit gray, Nina, if I may say, because you look at things that were not something a girl could dream of earlier on, of being a pilot, and now she's a pilot, of being an astronaut, of going out, even in the physical stamina field, the athletic women, all of that, they're doing that. And you've got men that are homekeepers, that are taking care of the children, that are artists. So you find that men are getting more in touch with their feminine side and women are getting in touch more with their masculine side. And it's no longer gender-based, it's more based on what are the gifts that are bringing to this world and what is the role that I'm playing here? And it's important early in the development of the child that each of our children is shown the opportunity that they can develop into anything they want as long as they dream it and they believe it, they can achieve it. And that comes from the parents because it's not what we do, it's not what we say that influences our children, it's what we do. So if you're gonna say, yeah, we respect each other and you know, you have to develop respect. Don't talk back at your mother. Don't talk back to your sister. And then we're not respecting each other. They're not gonna listen to what we're saying. They're gonna imitate what we're doing. So if we want our children to be better children, more well-behaved with the virtues, we need to be the role models for that. But we have these patterns and these behaviors. And sometimes it's difficult to change. If you've grown up in such a family, even though the world is changing, it takes time. 
So one of the beautiful things of pranic healing is that it works on these uh, core beliefs, these patterns that we have that make us behave in a certain way and not behave in another way to change that mold, like I said, Nina, so that we can better function, so that we can be better parents and that we can heal these. One of the amazing courses that you can study uh, that teaches you how to do that. And that's the beauty of the teachings of Master Choa. You don't need someone to do it for you. You can do it yourself. Is the pranic psychotherapy course. And in that, it's working on all these limiting beliefs, all the hurt, all the pain, all the trauma, going to the root cause of it and removing it. Another method is inner child healing. Going back, talking to the younger self of you, because Believe it or not, your inner child is most active when you embark on the journey of parenthood. And you'll notice that you're very calm in general, but then suddenly your child is two years old and you get agitated and they start throwing tantrums. And what you will come to know when you practice this conscious parenting and conscious awareness is that there's something in you that your child is triggering. So rather than focusing on the tantrum, Focus on what is causing the tantrum. Why is your toddler throwing a tantrum? And most of the time, it's lack of understanding, lack of communication. They want something. They don't know how to communicate it. You are hearing something else. Same as any relationship, there's communication, and you need to speak the same language. And during that early period, Using body language, using the five senses is one of the most crucial ways of communicating for children and most of the crucial ways of learning using the five senses. I think at any age, when they're smaller, younger, older, everyone responds to energy. That's something that we've definitely seen. And like you said, uh, Jeanne d'Arc, the importance of communication. We spoke about it in our last session, it's there. And also about being aware so I think one of the things that I really liked in the school is the awareness it brings with the, the kind of practices that are there, the step-by-step -step things one can do to become aware. And becoming aware is the first step to then transforming or changing anything. And we're in the last few minutes. I was looking at a few questions that are there. There's loads and loads of stuff uh, people have asked. But, you know, uh, one person has asked, what let's say if you put it in a nutshell, what are the things that one can do to have a healthy, strong, beautiful child? Now, I, I'd just like to say one thing that uh, this is something that I learned while I was studying psychology also and someone shared with me. Don't always expect your children to be angels. Children are supposed to be children. You know, not all of us were angels, <laughs> but we all as parents, when we come to that, we want our children to be perfect, you know? So one thing I definitely like to say is that uh, let your children be children. They, they're children. That's why they have to go through the process of growing up. And also another thing that I've heard, and maybe you can touch upon that, Jan Dark, is that we have, like you already said, we have to work upon ourselves because if we are whole, then we can have wholesome children. So uh, as we are coming towards the end of the time that is there, and maybe again, we'll take up some more questions in another session. And we are coming up also with women's, you know, the International Women's Day in just two days' time. So, what would be the one thing that you would like to say to all the women and men out there, you know, to to let's say to celebrate this feminine side because we all have both the feminine and the masculine to to celebrate and exalt the Shakti aspect, as they say in the Indian mythology. You know, you have the Shiva and the Shakti the Shakti aspect, which can help have uh, a better environment for the children, for the parents and everyone? Well, in a nutshell, I would say there's the Shakti and uh, that's the power aspect also, Nina. And there's the feminine aspect and the masculine aspect, but there's also the third that emerges. So the best way to look at it is one, First, none of us is perfect. So expecting perfection from our children is unrealistic. Expecting perfection from each other is unrealistic. So being realistic about our expectations. 
Second, to realize that each of us has a unique gift. Each of us is unique by ourselves. We come into this world with certain predisposition and we are shaped into uh, becoming who we are. And we have a gift. Each of your children has a gift. If you look at how the millennials work now, during our time, we would never have thought about it. The whole concept of influencer and making money just by posting pictures on Instagram would never have even crossed our mind. For us, it was hard work and you have to toil to earn money. And here they're having fun traveling around the world, selfie and million followers and millions of dollars coming in. The world is shifting and our perspective has to shift. So the first thing I would want us to do is celebrate womanhood, celebrate manhood, celebrate humanhood. We are all human. Each one of us is a being of divine light, divine love, and divine power. The woman, the mother is that, the father is that, the child is that. So when we practice that awareness that you talked about, Nina, and we approach our children, our spouses, from that point of each one is a unit of consciousness of divine light, divine love, and divine power, our approach is very different. And we realize that our children have gifts. And many parents that I work with after some time say, you know what, it's not me teaching my children. My children are teaching me. And Master Chua says this beautifully in one of his Golden Lotus Sutra books. And he talks about the path of the family. Many people here say, oh, I want to be a spiritual aspirant. I would achieve illumination. I want this, I want that. And in his book, Experiencing Being, the Golden Lotus Sutra on Life, Master Chua says that the family life is one of the fastest way of growing spiritually. He actually says that inevitably there is relationship friction, right? Each of us has a different predisposition, different personality. And so we develop self-sacrifice. Parents know how, what it is like to give and sacrifice. We develop self-control. We try to, you know, sometimes unless we're triggered and our kids know how to trigger us. That's why working on ourselves and healing ourselves is important. Patience, flexibility, and tolerance. So I would like us in that, as we come to the closing of this session, to do an invocation for our children because they are the present, they're teaching us, and they are the future. So I would like you to focus on your heart. That's the center of love. Think of your children, all the good things of your children. And that's one of the things that we need to do to, to build children up. You need to focus on their positives and repattern the negatives through building up the positives. So think of all the good things about your child. Focus on your heart. Think about the joy, the happiness. And if it's not there, visualize how you want it to be. Intention is very, very important. You may raise your hands in blessing position, facing outwards. You can visualize your children in front of you. But since we are a big group here and we know the power of energy, visualize also all the children in your family, all the children in your neighborhood, in your city, and the entire world. Remember, they are the future, they are the present, they're here now. They're teaching us and they're hoping that we pro provide them with a nurturing environment. And you may say to the Supreme God, we thank you for blessing all the children with your divine light, the light that manifests as understanding, as intelligence, as discernment, as wisdom. Thank you for blessing them with guidance, with love, love for themselves that manifested good self-esteem, good self-worth, love for others that manifests as kindness, as empathy and compassion, with mercy, with healing on all levels, healing of the past, we want the best for them and maybe sometimes things are not optimal so may the past be healed all the traumas of the past all the pains all the sorrows all the sufferings 
May they be healed of any sickness, physical and otherwise. May they be healed physically, emotionally, psychologically, mentally and spiritually. May they be blessed with good health on all levels, with inner strength, with divine help. May they be provided with divine help and protection on all levels. We thank you also for blessing them with spirituality, with abundance, abundance of experiences, of joy, abundance of growth, of happiness, of bliss, abundance of enjoying every moment in their life, experiencing it to the fullest, abundance that manifests as their gifts being presented to this world. And may they be blessed with prosperity on all levels. We thank you in full faith. Focus on your heart and crown. Continue to bless. The crown is that point on top of the head. Continue to bless the children. Bless them with all that you wish for them, all the goodness that they manifest their greatness on all levels. It takes all the colors of the rainbow to create a rainbow. Each of our children has a gift. And we celebrate that. May that gift be blessed. May we be blessed. Because after all, we are the children of this universe, living our lives, experiencing it. May our inner child be healed. May our past be healed. And may we create a better world for today and tomorrow. God's blessing with the blessing of all the higher beings. My spiritual teacher, Grandmaster Joel Kuxui, all the spiritual teachers, may each and every one be blessed. So be it, so be it, and so it is. Wow. Thank you, Shanda. That was really, really beautiful. And, uh, you know, someone had asked the question, why must we have children? And I remember what Master Choa says, why must we have children? So that we can develop our hearts. And that's where, you know, the heart is the center of love. That's where the love energy comes out from. And that's so important. Like another thing that he would constantly say, the secret is in the heart. And, uh, that's where it comes from. I know there are lots and lots of questions. We'll see. It's not possible to take all of them in time. We've already overshot a bit. And so you can all, you know, send us your questions. Uh, uh, you can go on to the Facebook page of World Pranic Healing, where today we were, for some technical error, not able to live stream it. But we will put this recording there. Uh, and uh, you can put your questions there. We'll take time to read them and answer them. Those of you who want to know about more classes, how you can take classes, you can contact the nearest local foundation in your area. You can have the online classes. Some of the classes are now online thanks to COVID times. Uh, you can found, find the schedule of the online classes also on www.worldpranichealingfoundation.com. The Achieving Oneness with the Higher Soul Workshop which Shanda spoke about a little while, is now online. There's also another self-healing one-day workshop available online so you can learn about energy and how to use that energy to heal yourself. And as you heal yourself, of course, that will affect the children because you form the environment for the children. So uh, to learn more about pranic healing, just feel free to contact us or the nearest foundation. And um, we take this opportunity to thank you all for being here. Thank you, Shandak, again for your time. I know you have a very busy schedule, but thank you for taking out the time. Thank okay. you, Nina, and thank you all for being here. That is truly empowered, not just parenting and healing, but empowered life. And that's what I love about these teachings. Like I said, Nina, all of these are in the books. And as parents, you don't need to be helpless. You can heal yourself, heal your children, and empower them to live their best life. 
Thank you. That's, that's really very, very true. So uh, keep a watch out for more sessions, more talks like this. You can also send us questions, like we said, and some of our colleagues uh, will be coming up with new talks, new topics, and see you all next time. Bye-bye, and have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. See you all Bye. next time. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend.